Oh my gosh, look at this guy. Howdy, howdy. If there is a silver lining to this global viral pandemic, which has been um, an unprecedented travesty in all of our lives, it might be the adoption of telehealth, quite honestly. There may be, at least from a medical standpoint, a silver lining in that telehealth was introduced at a, at a global level right away. Now, if we reflect, if I reflect back pre-COVID, my experiences were telehealth, were scant and miserable. I hated it. So I'm an MS neurologist, although um, in the past I worked in big healthcare systems where I was required to take general neurology call or stroke call, something that I do not like doing. And the one hospital system I worked in had a telehealth stroke unit. So at night, like once every eight weeks, I would have to stay up at night and God forbid when someone maybe had a stroke, I had to get on camera with them in the ER, try to do an exam on camera, figure out if I thought they had a stroke and then determine whether or not to give them a lytic, like Drano. And I didn't like that very much. It was really stressful and scary. Stroke is not my gig. Uh, and that was my only experience with telemedicine. <laughs> and I didn't like it at all. And if you had asked me to do telehealth, I would have said absolutely not, no thank you. I would have told you I'm a classically trained neurologist and I want to see my patients in clinic, which is still the case actually. But then, as Stuart shared with you, um, we were getting ready to launch the Boster Center for MS, where I'm presenting uh, to you right now. And we opened up after much to do on March 19th, 2020. And two days later, the governor of Ohio saw fit to close the state of Ohio. So here I had a 6,000 square foot clinic with lots of awesome clinic rooms and infusion stuff, and the whole state got closed down. That was not planned for. And I looked at my business manager and he looked at me and we said, I guess we're doing telemedicine. And we didn't know how to do telemedicine. Literally, we started to Google how we do telemedicine. And it was really, truly a hack and slash approach for the first several months, to be honest with you. In reality, it was a complete and total game changer. And, and what it has done for access to care uh, has really made me a true believer. And I want to kind of walk you through what that experience was like. So, so first off, there were some emergency laws that were put in place which allowed doctors to do telemedicine. And so because of the COVID emergency laws, doctors are now, in the, in the now, allowed to see people across state lines. So I'm an Ohio physician, I have an Ohio license, and so under normal circumstances, I couldn't do telehealth in California. But during the COVID pandemic, they liberalized that. Also, in the past, Telemedicine was not allowed to ever be done for a new consultative visit. So you couldn't meet someone for the first time on telemedicine. And the government said, ah, oh, go ahead and do that also. They really liberalized things quite a bit. Also, and this is important, they allowed billing to be the same on telemedicine as it is in the office, which made it viable. In the state of Ohio, I'm a medical marijuana recommender, and we were able to do that on telemedicine. And so they really just kind of liberalized things and it allowed us to do exactly what needed to be done, which was to provide tertiary level neuroimmunologic care to someone with a chronic condition, MS, despite the fact that it wasn't safe to be outside or travel. And that began uh, the journey of telemedicine in the world of MS. Here we are about 18 months later into the pandemic. And where is the new normal? What is the state of affairs? At least I can, I can share that with you as it relates to the Boster Center for MS. Telemedicine is deeply ingrained into my life. Literally between 50% and 75% of all the clinic visits are still being done via telehealth, quite literally. And I have found certain areas where I think it is the bomb.com. It's better than seeing someone in clinic. And I've also found some other areas where it's just like super not okay. So let me share a little bit of that with you. We have found a pattern where there's some wins with telemedicine. For example, if I'm going to see someone as a new consultative visit, I like to do a two hour visit when I meet someone because I need a lot of time to get to know you. And traditionally I would bring you to the clinic and we'd spend a really long time together. But what I found I can do is I can do the first hour on telemedicine. You mail me your MRIs and all of your lab reports and all of your other documentation from all your previous doctors and I receive it all and I look at everything before I see you. And then we jump on camera. 
and I review everything that I've read about. I take your history. I also go through all your MRIs where I pull them up on my screen and I show you my screen so we can look at them together. And then at the end of that first hour, we game out homework, things that you need to look up and do and things that I need to do. And then the second hour, I ask you to come in the office where I can examine you and we can game out what to do. And by breaking things up, I'm very efficient with our time. But most importantly, I prevent you from having to be exposed in the office. We have also found, for example, that doing routine MRI reviews is a brilliant thing to do on telemedicine. So what I used to do was you get your MRI in the morning and then you come to clinic and then I pull it up on the screen and we look at it. Now we do the same thing, except you get your MRI in the morning and then you go home and then you pull it up on the screen, telemedicine, and we go over it. There's a lot of things like that that work really, really well. We have found ways to augment telemedicine. So there are certain things that, that we want to collect information on that work really, really well across telemedicine. For example, patient reported outcome measures. I have a fancy pants electronic medical record and we have created a system where we can send you surveys, questionnaires about depression and anxiety and energy and a host of other things that are really, really important and you can fill them all out online just before I see you. And when we open up the chart, I can see everything that you did just before the visit and it informs our discussion. We are starting to use remote cognitive testing where I send you a special code, you log on to a special program and you do brain teaser tests online. I see the results and it actually is validated neuropsychometric testing. And so I can do that remotely, which is super cool. We've even started to use some very creative um, smartphone apps that measure hand function and walking function and cognition. So we're really trying to figure out how to make the most of telemedicine with the goal of keeping people safe and at home and creating access where there wasn't before. So before we transition to where I hope the future leads, I would like to spend a few short minutes and share some pro tips, things that I have discovered help optimize a telemedicine visit because it's my hope that this is something that is available to you and your family. So a couple pro tips when you're trying to get ready for a telemedicine visit. Number one, make sure that the device you're using is fully charged and plugged in. I can't tell you how many times a phone dies or a computer dies in the middle of a telemedicine visit. So getting that bad boy plugged in and fully charged is the first pro step. The second thing is to test out your internet connection. Don't uh, do it for the first time right when you're trying to log on. Check and make sure that your Wi-Fi is solid um, and if you need to change where you are or use a different hotspot or what have you, you want to take care of that ahead of time. Number three, you want to set your iPhone or your laptop up on a stand. You don't want to be doing this because if you're doing this, I, I, I'm going to need to test you. I'm going to need to do some things with your hands and it's going to be really, really challenging. And also it'll bounce around and it makes it really hard to see you. So if you can put your phone on a stand so that your hands are free, that's really helpful. Next, make sure that there's good lighting. And so if you're in a dark living room, I really sometimes can't see you very well. It's all in shadow. And if I'm trying to look at exam findings like on your face, I need it to be really well lit. So consider the lighting so that I can make sure that I can see you. Next, make sure that the area that you're going to do the telemedicine visit in is quiet. I can't tell you how many times I've seen a telemedicine uh, visit start. The patient is sitting in the driver's seat of their parked van. They have four children behind them that are quite literally jumping back and forth on the seats. And while the person's trying to have the telemedicine visit, they're trying to very casually smack their children and get them to stop it. And it really interrupts our ability to game out how to live your best life with MS. So make sure that it's as quiet as, as you can make it. Please have all of your medicine bottles present. So if we need to go over them, we can grab the bottle and look at it really quick. It's a really easy way of verifying medicines. Lastly, or maybe not lastly, but maybe two other things. I want you to prepare your questions. Now, MS Views and News on their website has a fantastic downloadable form that you can print out and then fill out. And it will guide you through getting all of your MS questions ready so that when you're on telemedicine, you have it in front of you. And, and that's a really important tool. The last pro tip is to consider inviting a village member to zoom in. So you can have your spouse or significant other or your sister, and even someone that lives in a different city, if you give them the zoom code, they can join camera. 
And so we can do like a modern version of the Brady Bunch where we have different cameras set up and we have different family members and, and uh, stakeholders and village members present. And it really can improve what we offer. Now, what's the future? Well, I don't know, but I can tell you what I wish it and hope it will be. I hope that the emergency medical laws that have allowed doctors like myself to provide access to underserved and underreached um, areas through telemedicine, I hope those laws persist. I hope that we are able to continue to use telemedicine. I hope that we are able, in fact, to see patients across state lines and the future looks bright. There is a new uh, licensure in the United States called an intrastate license, where if a doctor has an intrastate license, it's honored in other states that honor that same system. It's not available in Ohio yet, but as soon as it is, I will be applying for it. Check the mic and make sure it sound right, boys.